Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the Center for Court Innovation's third webinar in our series titled Sharing the Solutions to Homelessness, Police Court Partnerships. This is a series of four webinars. So again, we welcome you back. We'd like to take this moment to thank the United States Department of Justice, the Office of Community Oriented Policing Services for their support of this project. We greatly appreciate all the time and dedication you've put into this work. Today, we'll be joined by law enforcement and housing policy experts and learn about the relationship between police and people experiencing homelessness. We're incredibly fortunate today to have such a dynamic panel and of course our facilitator. Our team would like to thank our facilitator, Dr. Nikki Smith-Key for all of her work, not just on this panel this afternoon, but also as an advisory board member for this project. As a participant today, you'll have the chance to ask questions directly to the team during the discussion section of the presentation. If you would like to ask a question for the panel, be sure to type it in the Q&A box on the bottom of the chat function. Um, in the chat function, you'll see that you can either send a direction right to me or to the panel. Again, you can send it either way and we'll be reading our questions aloud to our speakers and audience. To share a little bit about more housekeeping before we begin, everyone should be automatically muted when they enter the webinar. And we ask that you please remain muted throughout the webinar so that recording quality is as clear as possible. If you're experiencing any technical issues during a webinar, please submit your questions in the chat box, which you'll find by hovering over the bottom of your screen and clicking on the label chat. If you're having any other difficulties with the audio or seeing the slides, please let us know that in the chat box so you can have the best experience this afternoon. If you don't immediately see the chat box, just click the word more in the chat function. After the webinar, we're gonna be distributing our slides and the recordings so that you may replay or share with your colleagues. Um, those are all of our housekeeping notes. We look forward to seeing all of your questions in the Q&A. And with that, I will pass my baton over to our facilitator, Dr. Nikki Smith-Key to begin the discussion. Thank you, Bonnie. So let me start by just introducing myself and then I'll ask Sarah and Daniel to introduce themselves. So hi everyone, Bonnie mentioned my name, Nicola Smith-Key. Everyone calls me Nikki, so please feel free to do so. I'm currently a criminal justice manager on the policing team at Arnold Ventures, which is a philanthropy dedicated to tackling some of the most pressing problems in the US. Our mission is to invest in evidence-based solutions that maximize opportunities and minimize injustice. And we're committed to driving public conversation, crafting policy and inspiring action through research, education and advocacy. A lot of the work that I've done, and Bonnie mentioned it, is at the intersection of policing, mental health, substance use disorder, and homelessness. So this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And so I'm looking forward to this dialogue with Sarah and Danielle. Sarah? Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Gillespie. I'm at the Urban Institute. We are a nonprofit research organization. We're based in Washington, D.C., but uh, we have work all across the country. Um, and I am a research director in our Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy Center. And so our policy center focused on, focuses on a lot of different things, but my work is really um, about housing and homelessness and how to end homelessness. And more and more, my work is at the intersection of homelessness with other systems. So criminal justice, child welfare, health and healthcare, um, really, so that is where my research focuses. Thank you, Sarah. Danielle? Hey everyone, Dan McDonald. I'm a police officer from the Tampa Police Department and also independent consultant. Uh, my job title officially is Homeless Liaison, which I always thought uh, sounded like something Henry Kissinger would do in Geneva. But basically what my problem is, is solving problems, oftentimes lack of housing. Um, we're very successful here in Tampa and also along with my, my uh, colleague from the Sheriff's Office, Stephanie, her and I go around the country presenting a uh, venue such as CIT International. I've also presented IACP, a Chief Police Conference. And basically we were eight years ago looking for a better way to um, not arrest away homelessness, which didn't work very well. So we needed new ideas. Thanks, Nikki, back to you. 
absolutely. So this is uh, what we've decided to call a fire ch side chat. We're not doing PowerPoints. I think we're all over PowerPoints. Um, so let me start by thanking you all for joining us. This is something I've been doing for webinars that have been joining. I want to take a few seconds to acknowledge and recognize this time of trauma and difficulty that we're all experiencing in a world consumed by, affected by, and impacted by the spread of COVID-19. Most of us are trying to and learning to adjust to this new normal. So thank you again for taking the time to be with us and to share in this discussion. If you're here with us today, you have an interest in better understanding law enforcement and homelessness. On any given night, nearly 550,000 people, 550,000 people, parents, kids, veterans are homeless. We know that communities across the United States continue to grapple with the interconnected challenges posed by mental health crises, substance use disorder, and homelessness, and the alignment of resources to respond to people experiencing a behavioral health crisis, particularly those who are frequent utilizers to the justice, health, and human services systems. So as we proceed, bear with me because there are no simple questions. So let's get right to it. Sarah, I'll start with you. Let me ask you to begin by just helping us to understand the state of the field as it relates to unsheltered homelessness. What has it looked like over the last 10 years? What are the major drivers for where we find ourselves today and who is most impacted? Sure, thanks Nikki. So this is a big question and um, I know folks in the audience today are going to have varying levels of familiarity with the field of, of ending homelessness and where our efforts have been over the last 10 years. So I'm gonna to try to give everyone um, the same level of kind of, let's set the field, let's set the stage of how things are looking right now. And so, you know, we talk, when you look about, when you look at trends in homelessness, there are different types of homelessness that we talk about. Most people who are enduring homelessness are sheltered. So they're in some sort of temporary shelter in their community. Um, but about a third of all people who are experiencing homelessness are unsheltered, meaning they are outside in the elements, they're in a car, they're somewhere that's not meant um, for sleeping and human habitation. And compared with people who are in shelters, people who are living outside um, just face different risk factors. So they are um, more likely to experience physical trauma, less likely to be engaged in services, have, they are more likely to have longer durations of homelessness, um, and, and what we know about unsheltered homelessness is that it's actually increasing. Um, so if you look at the last 10 years from 2009 to 2015, the number of people enduring unsheltered homelessness was declining. But starting in 2015, that number started going up again. Um, and in 2019, it, it, so it had from 2015 to 2019, it grew 22%. Um, and, and this is highly correlated with geography, right? So unsheltered homelessness varies widely in scale across the country, but it's definitely more pervasive in urban areas and on the West Coast. And there are reasons for that. There are drivers for that. Um, higher rates of overall homelessness and specifically unsheltered homelessness correlate with a lack of affordable housing. Um, and that lack of affordable housing comes from um, also lack of available housing assistance to afford housing. So housing assistance is woefully underfunded. Only one in five people who are eligible for federal rental assistance um, receive it. Um, people can be on waiting lists for years. Um, and even when it's available, there can be lots of barriers that, that make it hard for people to access that assistance. So that's really just telling you some of, we are seeing an increase in unsheltered homelessness. It is correlated um, in geographic areas where housing affordability um, is an issue. And even when there is assistance available, it can be really hard to access it. The other things we know is that 
Most people enduring unsheltered homelessness are individuals. Um, there are families who experience unsheltered homelessness, but the trends are really driven by an increase in individuals who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. We also know that Black and Indigenous people are particularly overrepresented among people experiencing homelessness and in particular among people enduring unsheltered homelessness. Um, and that is due um, to a lot of the disparities we see in other systems as well. And then, you know, we're talking today during a global pandemic and in response to the pandemic, we've seen the capacity of emergency shelters and other temporary housing um, reduce even further where communities are trying to um, adhere to guidelines in a lot of places. They're trying to space folks out and it just tightens um, the capacity of a lot of places to house people. And then the last thing I'll just say is that um, at this time when unsheltered homelessness is increasing, we see even more clearly the link between homelessness and the criminal legal system or the criminal justice system and how deeply in intertwined those two systems are. Um, and you can see it both ways. So sometimes people become homeless um, immediately at release from jail or from prison. Um, they, you know, even if they have somewhere to go, they face ongoing challenges, securing employment or housing. Um, and it goes the other way. If someone is living on the street, enduring unsheltered homelessness, they're almost 10 times more likely um, to go to um, be arrested and, and, and have a jail stay. So that cycle, we call it the homelessness jail cycle in some of my research, um, is just really coming in to view during, the, especially during this pandemic time. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. That's, I know that was a lot of background and, and we'll get into some more of the details later on. And, and that's really important. And I, I think two points that you brought home is unsheltered homelessness is increasing. And there is an, a deep, interrelationship between homelessness and, and the criminal legal system, which you all call it. Danielle, with the rising number of unsheltered homelessness, there has been and continued to be this public outcry. A term that I've, been, I've heard being used is the tyranny of the housed. In the United States of America, we have accepted and acted on this us versus them narrative. And in response to that narrative, we've criminalized homelessness. I'll take the liberty of being the moderator to ask a pretty broad question and a question that's on the mind of many now as we're steeped in arguments and hear a new public cry to, out, to, to defund police. So let me ask you these questions. What is the current role police for police in responding to people experiencing unsheltered homelessness? And what should be the role of police in responding to people experiencing unsheltered homelessness? So you want to defund the police. Okay. Okay. How long do we have here? Okay. No, no, seriously. Yeah. Good for, no, it's a very good question. Um, I think defunding the police, I, I don't really like that term because um, I think it sort of implies that it's a zero sum game. You can either have funding for the police or you can have funding for social um, services such as or mental health services, behavioral health services, addiction resources. And I think that people are looking at a zero sum game, you can have one or the other, but not both. And I disagree with that. You need all of the systems. Here in Florida, we have the dubious distinction of being 50th out of 50th in per capita health, mental health spending. So that puts us as the police as kind of the de facto response to homelessness, mental health, addictions, unsheltered homelessness. So, um, and the, the police never never asked for that role. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I love my job. And I think it's working very well here in, um, in our, uh, the sheriff's office, Hillbrook County Sheriff's Office, which we're very closely with. So I kind of found that the police kind of fall into three different camps for how to respond to homelessness. And I developed a name for it, very unscientific. I call it the Daniel McDonald's pyramid of social inertia. At the bottom, you have uh, most communities where they just try to maintain the status quo. In other words, do nothing. Not very effective, but 
it's someone else's problem. It's the county's problem. It's the city's problem. It's not our problem. It's social services problem. So we just ignore it and hope it'll go away, which it, which it won't. In fact, as as Sarah said, it's getting it's getting worse. We all know that. The second one is you can, which many more communities try and do, is to maintain homelessness, and that can be, and that is usually through the criminalization of homelessness. And I put people into two different categories. You have the um, you have the homeless who might commit what are often defined as minor nuisance crimes for for basic for basically trying to survive out there on the streets. That could be camping, sleeping in public, urinating, and defecation, et cetera, in public. And um, and then we'll the police and the homeless being traditional adversaries will kind of kind of the us versus them. Well. You have to, well, if you can't do something that's we've dubbed illegal, we'll catch you, we'll take you to jail, or some communities have done, we'll take a jail, it's no longer jail, we'll rename it a homeless shelter, and we'll put you in there, warehouse you there in the public or outside of the public view. Uh, it's not very effective, it's just a cheaper form of incarceration. So, and you also have, um, if, if people are engaging in life-sustaining activity and that's all they're guilty of, that's that's one thing. We we need to address the uh, come up the underlying problem rather than the symptom. For example, um, uh, one gentleman in our community named Billy, he's the most uh, prolific offender in our community. He's been to the Hillsborough County Jail almost uh, 200 times in his um, in his homeless career. Um, and he's never committed a felony. In other words, someone that you can receive prison time for is trespassing, drinking in public. He spent an aggregate of um, about uh, 10 years in jail, 30, 60, 90 days at a time. Which So the jail becomes a very expensive homeless shelter, becomes a very expensive mental health facility as well. So in our community, because we have effective diversion programs, um, we have good homeless programs, then um, we actually have too much jail space. Um, yes, you heard right. We have too much jails. Whereas the county I live in, we they pass a bond to build more jails. So perhaps they need to look at different methods in other communities. So the third solution at the top of the pyramid, which is the least common but becoming more popular, is actually solving homelessness. Now. What I what I do and my colleague Stephanie does is very much on the ground level retail homeless outreach boots on the ground very labor intensive, and we solve problems that can be anywhere from helping someone get an ID um, to um, I've even arranged a marriage uh, a wedding um, get people into housing. If I as the police can solve that problem and get people off the streets, one I'm solving that call for service of someone being unsheltered and I'm and and eliminating that call of service down the road maybe the 10 more like the billies of the world that are generating calls that call after call the very high utilizers of the criminal justice system medical system etc so if I can solve the problem as a police officer or and it doesn't matter with a cop or social services the homeless services the end result is the same we can our homeless rate will go down um, Going back to kind of uh, um, uh, defunding the police, how about reimagining the police? Perhaps we need to get more of a service orientation. Um, what would I tell, how would you think if I told you as a police officer, I take more people out of jail than take people to jail. I haven't made an arrest in eight years. I haven't written a ticket. I don't have a printer. I'd have to call someone else. So when I go to jail to take someone out, so. How is that that so some of us have been reinventing the police for a long time um, by kind of redefining our metrics of what you would consider a good police officer. If you look at uh, my traditional performance metrics of a cop, arrests, citations, I, I'm absolutely horrible. Um, you, you're going to think I just eat donuts all day or, or drink coffee. Um, but we have to have a service function that's solving homelessness. So. If more communities have gone on board with trying to look at homelessness, which homelessness is not the problem, it is a symptom of a problem, which can be lack of housing, et cetera, lack of resources, et cetera. Um, so if we kind of go into problem solving mode as a, as a community, rather than 
just looking at the symptoms, then I think we'll, we'll be a lot better off. So how long so, winded, so, I hope, so. hope, uh, hope that was okay. Absolutely. So what I'm hearing from you is it's time to take enforcement out of law enforcement. Yes. What I'll, what I'll say to the, to the audience that's out there is within your own community, what does the response look like? Are you familiar with what that response looked like? And is it the most appropriate response? Now, let me move on to another question. We know there's a need for more holistic response. And you mentioned diversion programs, and we know that there's a growing number of diversion programs out there. There is a need for more holistic response, a more systematic, coordinated, and comprehensive approach. And we know that jurisdictions around the country have varying models of response and promising practices. What do we know about alternative responses? And what do we know about alternatives to arrest? Daniel, I'll start with you. And then Sarah, I'll, I'd love for you to join in as well and tell us about some of the evidence that's out there. Yeah, Nick, you know, actually, I, I credit you, you with um, the idea that really was pretty profound of taking the, the enforcement out of law enforcement and get more towards the service orientation. Now, you need a balance. If I had, uh, we have a, a, an agency of about a thousand officers. So there's two of us that do homeless outreach and there's plenty of work to go around. So we need more. But if there was, um, if there was, was no officers making arrests for, you know, going, if you're, if you need housing and you go and rob a bank to pay for your rent, well, that's bank robbery. That's a felony. You go to prison for that. So you, you need people doing enforcement, but if you are if 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 you're in a community where you've got the couple of uh, organ like National Homelessness Law Center um, or the Southern Legal Council, if 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 they if you if you're getting sued by them, for example, then you've got a really bad, in my opinion, response to homelessness. You need to have a more holistic approach. So you need to balance. The model that we use here, and uh, myself and my colleagues, is I am the I'm basically the, all I do is homeless outreach. Uh, we also do behavioral health, CIT, which is crisis intervention, et cetera. We do that. So I've got a saying, unless you confess to the great train robbery at Lufthansa house, heist, you can tell me pretty much anything in confidence and it stays between us. And I'll help you solve that problem. We've got a very good relationship with the public defender. Uh, Marie just texted me um, before this. Um, she's going to she's going to watch so we have very good relationships with with the courts we have very good relationships with the the jails and the behavioral health facilities um myself and my colleague stephanie were on the board of directors for a for a behavioral health facility um so we really it's really a community effort and uh, i think kind of your the community really has to reflect, you know, do, are you serious about ending homelessness or, or are you just going to try and hide the problem, pretend it doesn't exist and hopefully don't get sued? Mm -hmm. So so we know collaboration is the key um, and, and we should foster collaboration across sectors with a full range of partners. What is also important is data. Data is important to understand, to inform policy and practice and to determine what is most appropriate response? Sarah, I know that you are in, in, a, in, a, in many times deep in the research and the evidence. So I'd love for you to tell us about what some of the evidence is telling us. Sure. Yeah, so I'm on a team here at Urban that recently did a deep dive into the evidence around alternatives to arrest for people enduring unsheltered homelessness. And we really, um, found three categories of, of approaches or interventions. And the first is by far the strongest, most evidence-based um, approach to ending homelessness um, and reducing and offering these alternatives to arrest. And that's connections to housing. I think that's not, it's not gonna blow anyone's mind. Daniel just talked about this. Um, but that's where the, the research evidence is. Um, and so when we talk about connections to housing, then there is a specific approach to connections to housing, and it's called Housing First. And I'm sure many on this webinar are familiar with that, but it means um, a connection to housing without any preconditions or requirements. And this is a shift in the field of homelessness assistance um, in the last 10 years. 
prior to that, um, housing assistance often came with a lot of strings attached. So whether it was sobriety or participation in services, they were barriers that made it really hard uh, for folks to make that leap um, into, into housing. And so housing first flips that on its head and says, you can't work on all of these other challenges until you have a place to live, a roof over your head. Um, so housing first, can be used in different models. Um, most commonly, we talk about permanent supportive housing and rapid rehousing as two of the big models that you see across the country. Permanent supportive housing, just like it sounds, it's permanent. Um, that's usually for people with um, a disability, whether it's physical, behavioral, mental health disability. Um, they often need that permanent assistance to be able to leave the homelessness jail cycle. Um, and permanent supportive housing has a lot of um, rigorous evaluation evidence behind it. Many randomized controlled trials that show around 40% reduction in days in jail um, for people who are in permanent supportive housing. Um, so high rates of housing stability and pretty significant rates of reduction in time in jail. Um, rapid rehousing is a more short-term short subsidy. Um, communities use it to get assistance to as many people experiencing homelessness as possible, but it's also got some pretty good research evidence behind it in terms of helping people leave homelessness and not return to homelessness. Um, and then the other important thing to know about these approaches, um, a lot of them use what we call jail in reach. So, um, what Daniel was talking about, going to the jail, meeting with folks, making that plan for release, making that housing plan before um, they're released to the streets in the middle of the night with no plan. Um, so jail in reach is another important piece of that evidence. Um, but like, you know, we all know the ability to connect someone to housing is dependent on housing resources in your community. And in most places, those just there's just not enough. And so we also looked at some other strategies um, like public space management. So that's making it easier for people who have to live on the street to do so without um, interacting with the police frequently. So for example, in Santa Barbara, California, it looks like a program that helps people sleep safely in their cars and provide a safe parking lot where that could happen instead of having them um, continually come in contact with police over parking violations. Um, and then another category that we see being replicated quickly across the country, um, alternative crisis response models. So, you know, instead of having police be the only option to respond to someone in crisis on the street, uh, being able to dispatch uh, social workers or behavioral health clinicians or to have them go along with a police officer. Um, and so this can look very different. In some places, they do provide, you know, special training for police officers um, to do that work. Sometimes they do it together, and sometimes um, 911 will divert those calls entirely um, to more of a social provider um, organization. The thing to know is that we still, there's a lot for us to learn about these models. Um, I think that they're replicating by the week right now um, based on the news. And we just don't have a lot of research evidence. I know a lot of communities are collecting some good data and get, seeing some good outcomes and the research needs to catch up so that we know more about um, the best way to implement these programs. They all look a little different from place to place and what kind of outcomes um, they're getting. Great, thank you. Um, so, so we know evidence supports alternatives to arrest rather than punitive policing approaches. And the crisis response models are developing and scaling across the country, despite the little data available. So we know that from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, they look a little differently. And again, I always pose questions to the audience. Are you aware of the alternatives to arrest or the alternative responses within your own community? And what is the data saying about those responses in the community? And for those who are on this webinar, who are policymakers, who are practitioners, I'll encourage you to really look into that and to partner with research or entities, partner with a university, partner with a, 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 a professor to help to understand what the state of the field is in your community. And as I mentioned the word community as well, I often say that people who are most impacted should be a part of the solution. 
So the question to both panelists are, is, is there a role for community? And what does that look like? And Danielle, I'll start with you and then Sarah. You definitely need the community, in particular community buy-in. Um, I've been doing this for eight years. I've actually had public records requests for my budget. Well, I can I can is I can remember it around number zero. I have no I have no budget other than my salary equipment. Um, so I I'm sort of like Google for the homeless. That's what I call myself. So I'm we we're, we're an access point. Uh, we have access to coordinated entry. Um, a few years ago, we went to our local COC or Continuum of Care, which is the lead agency in every in each community. Hi, I'm from the police. Can you give us access to our to your homeless management information system? And we now have access, or we have legal agreements. Basically, we can't use it for criminal justice purposes, but I can go into the same system that homeless that the uh, service providers have, and we work together. Because ultimately, because I'm out there engaging people on the streets. Um, and then I'll help them particularly get IDs, kind of the the uh, the boots on the ground type of work, and then and then kind of do a warm handoff to the service providers. So that's very that's very critical because um, you need basically I'm sort of the intake into the, into the homeless system. Um, many many times we can uh, we can sort of di uh, divert people. That's a very important diverting them out of the homeless system and try and uh, try and keep them out of the system totally. And that's much more effective and cheaper in the long run, too. So it really does take a community. One of the challenges with the homeless services and the criminal justice system is ver is siloization or, or bucketing. You have these buckets of services um, such as, well, I can only help veterans, I can only help victims of domestic violence, I can only help uh, uh, this subpopulation, I can only help the chronically homeless, I can only help the those with substance abuse. So um, so that and that's a big problem and we all need to work together in one system and be able, be able to integrate people into the various services and navigate them. Kind of what, what I do is, is system navigation. Um, and one of the slides that for those who have suffered through one of my presentations, then one of my slides is I compare a flow chart of uh, chronic homelessness from HUD uh, with a flow chart of a nuclear reactor. And the nuclear reactor is by far simpler. So we live in a time when we can, we can uh, make a nuclear reactor appear simpler than exiting homelessness or de even defining homelessness or chronic homelessness. So that's really why we need people to work together. Because if we're working at, well, I'm the police and we're going to arrest everyone and your outreach and you're going to try and get to them before we arrest them and your housing and where is everyone? Well, they're all in jail and we can't go to jail. So we've got to work together. We don't work together. It's just a big waste of time and resources. Thanks, Danielle. Sarah, I'd, I'd love to get your response on the role of the community and for both of you also to share with me who are some of those key players that should be collaborating? What should that look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you say community, two things come to mind for me. One would be other stakeholders who have a role to play in ending homelessness and then folks who are experiencing homelessness themselves. Um, and so when, when I, I think about it from the viewpoint of research and what we need to learn um, to improve how we respond and so, for example, um, there's a lot we need to know from people who are experiencing homelessness themselves and how they experience um, efforts to create alternative responses. So, you know, how do their experiences in a community where there is um, an alternative crisis response program, how do their experiences with those people differ from, you know, the status quo um, or the way that the community responded before that alternative program? Um, how do they perceive the effects on their well-being and their quality of life? There's a lot that we can learn from administrative data, but there's a lot we can't learn, that we just need to talk to the people um, who are experiencing this. And so things like quality of life and well-being um, and humane treatment, a lot of that, we just have to talk. Um, 
And then, you know, how do their perceptions and their experiences vary? So people who are experiencing homelessness and are not all the same. Um, and, and we think that their experiences and their um, reactions to different response models or approaches would be different. And so that's the other important reason to really talk to people. Um, so, so there's that part of the community and then there's the part of the community that are the other stakeholders who have a role to play. So the people who are interested in reducing ED visits and the people who are interested in reducing detox and sobering center visits, um, all of those are folks that need to have a role to play in terms of um, how will we identify people and how will we do warm handoffs. Um, just one example, I think I mentioned earlier before is that um, I work on a project in Colorado and we found that one of the, the key points where something wasn't working is when people are released from the jail and it happens to be in the middle of the night and in the middle of the winter and you can't get on a bus because the buses aren't running and you can't get into a shelter at that time of night and so can we change how that release happens and when it happens and and strengthen that handoff to um, homeless assistance providers um, so the other stakeholders have a huge role to play as well thank you so much sarah danielle did you have anything else to add on that question no, not really. I mean, that's as Sarah hit the nail on the head. It's really it's all about working together and um, having a, a community approach to problem solving rather than an individual or individual agency approach. Perfect. So community needs to be involved in determining the solution. And thank you, Sarah, so much for pointing out that community just doesn't just mean the persons who are in positions of power but also the individuals with lived experience. Are we talking to them to have an understanding of what they're experiencing and what the solu solutions should look like? So as we come to the end, because we want to have questions from the audience, I'll take the liberty as the, the, the facilitator again to ask pretty broad questions. How do we, do things differently and change this current, and I'll, I'll use the word destructive and dehumanizing trajectory. How do we change? And are there solutions to this problem? And what do those look like? Sarah, I'll start with you and then Danielle. Yeah, and I did already hit on some of that evidence around um, interventions like permanent supportive housing and rapid rehousing, and um, I can provide some links to folks who want to go deeper into that evidence. But I also want to say, you know, Nikki's question was, how do we do things differently? And we've been paying attention during the, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, and communities are doing things differently as they've been forced to because of the pandemic. Jail populations around the country have dropped drastically because of CDC recommendations and guidelines for spacing and concern for health. Um, in some places, we've seen uh, police contacts and arrests with people who are experiencing homelessness specifically drop drastically. There's been the CDC guidance around um, not dispersing encampments because it interrupts their connections to service providers. It spreads. Um, their, you know, um, community out. And so I think we're seeing that things can go differently. And the question is, will we return to the status quo after COVID-19? Um, and if not, will we take this opportunity to say, we've seen what happens um, and can we take that to the next level and make that part of how we respond. And the other thing that we're watching closely, we know that a lot of communities um, opened up new motel space for people who are experiencing homelessness. So that motel space is gonna come to an end and will people return to the street? What will communities do? We also know a lot of the communities who have um, opted for tickets in lieu of arrest right? A lot of those folks are going to have court dates coming up. Will they um, have the support they need to appear for that? Will we see a lot of the failure to appear that this community struggles with that results in the warrant for arrest? 
So I think we're coming up on a time period where we really need to think about where do we go from here and how do we connect people to the housing and services that will get us where we need to go and not return to the huge levels we've seen of overlap between people who experience homelessness and people who um, spend time in jail. Thank you, Sarah. Danielle, how would you respond to that question? How do we do things differently? What needs to happen? Well, we have um, the, the pandemic has given us the um, opportunity, I, I suppose, to rethink homelessness on a broad level um, and rethink how are we addressing the, the, the problem? You have to have buy-in from the top down. Um, homelessness is not an issue that someone is going to run uh, for office on. Uh, the only elected official I know that has won uh, on that platform is from my hometown of Eng in Manchester, England, is Greater Manchester Mayor Andy Burnham. That was one of his platforms. Other than that, usually affordable housing will get some traction, but that's really kind of a factor, but not really a homeless issue. Um, so it's, it's a good opportunity to, to rethink how we, how we do things. The system is, um, I'm kind of a systems guy. I like trying to break down and rebuild systems. It's a very complex system. Uh, like Sarah says, uh, you know, no one never asks a homeless, like, what do you need? How can we help you? And that's always that's the question I ask. What what do you need to get out of homelessness? So we need to, the people with shared experiences. Uh, we need uh, buying from elected officials. We have communities that say, oh, well, I'm I'm in favor of uh, more housing for the homeless as long as it's not in my backyard or NIMBY, as we all know. So people in theory support it, but they're not willing to to um, spend with a pocketbook and. Um, Kind of the argument I approach is is that it is uh, the economic cost of homelessness is very high. I've got a whole presentation devoted to this. Uh, so you're actually saving money by ending homelessness. If, like Sarah thought about housing first, it, it saves a, a ton of money. Um, it's very good. Very good. Um, it's very good public policy and the rewards rate. So I'm hoping that we, as a society and nation, take the opportunity to rethink how we are going to address homelessness and, um, you know, rethinking, defunding the police, rethinking the police that is starting to co-respond to models. We're looking at that. The sheriff's office next nearby has one as well. So I think change is going, but you know, whether we'll go back to the status quo after this is over, I don't know. That's going to be a tough one. Thank you both. Any final thoughts from you both until um, while we prepare to just go to some Q&A, some questions and answers? Any final thoughts, Danielle? Um, if you have an idea, you know, just get, if you have an idea or you can make a difference, people can make a difference. Um, and um, just go out there, start the, start the conversation and be a part of uh, be a part of change of good change and positive change like my my uh, favorite movie quote hope is a good thing maybe the best of things mm -hmm. great sarah any any final thoughts before we go to q a no just that i know everyone on this call is doing the work in their own community and so my plug is to to collect the data and, and share how things are going, because I think so many of these great questions I'm seeing in the Q&A should be answered by the other participants on this call. Um, where I sit here in my office and, and look at the research and try to share that, but really excited to learn from what all of you on this call are doing as well. Great, thank you, Sarah. So a, a couple questions have come in and I'll just um, send them to individual panelists. And for some of the questions, I'll ask both of you to respond to them. So Sarah, there's a question um, from Nate Shrital from Wichita. Hi, Nate. The 22% increase in unsheltered homelessness is also what we're seeing across the nation as well. Are there any recent studies on why this is? I remember hearing about affordable housing well before 2015, so I hesitate to think that's the issue. In Wichita, we have seen a 39% increase in meth cases since 2015, 
And we're seeing people camp more, ev even more though, um, there is shelter beds available. So what is there? Is there an explanation as to what is going on for this increase in unsheltered homelessness? Yeah, I would just caveat my response, but I think every community is going to have probably a slightly different answer. Nationally, we know the data show us that it is very strongly correlated with affordable housing. So even though that's been the answer, it's definitely still the answer. Um, although I don't doubt that community to community, there are probably other driving forces as well. I think the question around seeing more people camp is also probably you would want to look to what's going on, right? That would make it more easier or um, necessary for someone to sleep outside than to come into a shelter. So what are the barriers to going into that shelter? Are they allowed to come in with their partners? Are they allowed to be there during the day? Are they um, required to participate in some sort of service while they're staying there? I think that's commonly what we see when people would prefer to live outside than go into a shelter that with those types of barriers um, but it's going to vary so much from community to community thank you sarah um, there was a question from a panelist on whether or not they would be able to see your research sarah and daniel whether or not you can also share your handout on the economics of ending homelessness so i'll just make a broad statement to the audience that we will put together resources. So if you're interested in any resources, just put it in the chat function and we will make sure that that goes out to everyone. Danielle, um, a question that came in, what kind of data points do you track in your work and how has your police department come to define success as it relates to the work around homelessness? That's the first part of the question and I'll read that again. What kind of data points do you track in your work and how has your police department come to define success as it relates to the work around homelessness? And additionally, since you are not taking enforcement action, why do we still need a police officer doing the work we're doing? Yeah, very good questions. Um, in terms of data, it's very difficult to measure. There's a couple of different ways of doing homeless outreach. The most common is called contact-driven outreach. I'll go out there, which is usually mandated by grants. Um, it's a, attempted to be a, a performance measure. I'll go out and talk to as many homeless people as I can. I won't really have much of an impact. I won't really solve anything. But hey, I talk to lots of people and I can't talk to you anymore because I've got to go and talk to someone else and so on and so on. Um, the other point of view um, is impactful outreach, um, and uh, which is basically I'm dealing with less people, but I, am, I, I work the problem from start to finish. Uh, the longest I've taken to house um, any one person is four and a half years, which is um, just, I just did not give up. One gentleman who I recently helped, uh, who was born in rural Georgia, he was 61 years old, well, still is, I just talked to him yesterday. Um, Herschel, he's 61 years old, he's born in rural Georgia. He never had a birth certificate, so he couldn't get an ID. So he legally doesn't exist. So how would you solve that? Well, it took me three years and nine months to solve that, which is basically gathering his whole life in elementary school records, marriage records, child, child's birth certificate, assembling his whole life in documents. So I can, I spent almost four years doing that so he could get an ID and get into housing, et cetera, versus, well, sorry, Herschel, I can't spend more than five minutes because I got to go and spend five minutes with someone else. So. So it's basically solving the, the problem. And in, if enough people do that and it gathers momentum, then if everyone has a net positive change in society from for each day to go to work, then it has a cumulative effect. How do you measure that? It's very difficult because the traditional contact driven outreach is very ineffective. And this can be challenging dealing with my bosses sometimes is with, with, with that dealing with a whole different definition of, of police work. Um, and then I just look at our homeless rate, um, our homeless rate in Hillsborough County, which Tampa is in, is going down. And so we are one of two um, communities cited uh, 2017 by Forbes magazine, Houston being the other one, of major cities where homelessness is going down. 
homelessness is going down. We have jails, they're seeing empty. Um, so, so that's a good barometer. Now, I can't take the credit for all of that, but um, uh, for some of that anyway. So in terms of the kind of the second part of the question is in, in, in terms of not taking enforcement action, can someone else do my job? Yeah, absolutely. But at the end of the day, I've outlasted every single social worker in homeless outreach in Hillsborough County. So the I've been around for, for eight years um, um, doing homeless outreach. The homeless can call me. I'll get up to about 1,800 phone calls in a busy month. So they can call me and they'll I'll still be there. They won't, they, there won't be someone else there a month or a year from now. So yeah, we don't have a monopoly on it. In fact, the more the better, but um, we are able to work the problem from start to finish, even if it takes years and many other agencies can't do that. So when the whole reason the police or I were, were got into this in the first place was no one else was doing anything about it. So it's often a very a reaction to, at least initially, that no one was, no one else was working on the problem. That has since changed and we have a lot more resources. We've got about $40 million going to, into housing for the next couple of years. So, yeah, so there's, there's definitely room for others and uh, out there, but yeah, I don't have a monopoly on it, but um, as, as long as there's a need for me, I'll be here. Great, thank you. So a, a really interesting question that came in and something that we are very much interested in at Arnold Ventures is how would a 911 diversion for homelessness outreach happen? What kinds of questions are dispatchers asking and how are, how are we differentiating situations that require social workers only from situations that require a social worker and the police for safety? So that's a question around both 911 diversion and also a co-responder type program. How does that happen in practicality? And I'll ask both of you to respond and then I'll jump in as well with a, with a, with a bit of a response to that as well. Daniel, I'll start with you and then Sarah. Okay, well, there's a couple of different approaches, there's a couple of different issues here. One is you're calling 911, no one ever calls 911 because they're having a, they're having a good day, it's because they're in crisis. Um, and that's what we're here for. So you have crisis response mode and you have problem solving mode. It's very difficult to do both. You can have people doing separate functions, such as uh, uh, co-responder models or or, or folks um, calling to to get immediate assistance. So, and that can be as simple as uh, where is he? Uh, was he? Um, we had a, well calls for us. It was about fifty degrees last night here in Florida, so that's calls calls for here. Um, like where is the cold weather shelter tonight? To uh, you know, we're, I'm in crisis, I'm, I'm having a mental health breakdown. So you have crisis response mode and you have problem solving mode. I'm more of, I don't really, I don't usually respond to calls for service. I do sometimes, but most of the time, all of my work is very appointment driven. I'm just kind of working the problem from start to finish. So there's definitely room for, for both, but they're kind of separate, but equal, if that makes sense. Thank you. Sarah, any responses to that 911 question? I would say your question basically outlines the research we need to do. I think there's a lot of what we would say were promising practices, communities who say they're having success, um, who can talk about what they're doing. But like I said, there's no research evidence on what would work best, like which criteria for diverting calls are, is most appropriate and leads to the best outcomes. Those are the questions we really need to answer. Um, one of the programs that I'm sure many on this call know about, CAHOOTS out of Eugene, Oregon, is one of the longest running um, alternative crisis response models. They do use 911 and divert calls from 911 to the CAHOOTS team. So that's one place to look. But again, we need more research evidence on this. Thank you, Sarah. And I'll just add as well, um, and again, feel free, and at the end, you will see our email addresses to reach out to us. This is an area that Arnold Ventures is really interested in at the moment, and we literally just had meetings regarding this. Many of you on the phone would know 18,000 agencies. The number of 911 centers are also really large. There are over 6,000 911 centers doing their own thing. Um, and so it's a black box of information that we want to understand. Houston Police Department has a really robust program that they started about four, four years ago 
um, with funding from the Bureau of Justice Assistance, from the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Grant. And what they did, they actually embedded social workers in their 911 center. And so the call takers are getting the calls, they're sending them to dispatch. They have come up with the protocols for questions to ask, and they're diverting calls to the social workers within the 911 center. I believe in one year, there were over 40,000 calls diverted to those individuals in the 911 center. So there are systems that are being put in place. I know Boston was also thinking of trying that. LAPD was also thinking of trying that. Uh, um, so please do feel free to reach out to us. I, could, I would more than be willing to connect folks to the Houston folks if you would like to learn more about what that looks like. In the chat as well, we got a, 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 just some follow-up to that 911 question. Um, and thank you for, for this comment that I think we can certainly be co-responders to most of those calls, but I'm not sure how to identify calls that don't need a police at all, especially in some areas with high concentration of homelessness accompanied by violent crime. So again, this is not something that's going to happen overnight. And there are certainly ways to work collaboratively to put together those protocols that are necessary for a 911 diversion program. Um, another comment that came in, the corresponder question wants, to, um, how can 911 identify calls that don't need police, especially in some areas with high concentration of homelessness? So that's a, sorry, a repeat from what was said earlier. The, the misconception, I think, and. Danielle and, and Sarah to jump in is that not all everyone experiencing homelessness is a violent criminal and we need to move away from that definition of human beings who are in unfortunate situations because of the lack of resources for them to live like the rest of us right so we need to move away from that thinking that once we define someone as being homeless or experiencing homelessness that they're a violent criminal. In the great United States, it takes a day and two for me to become homeless. And we need to be and put ourselves in the shoes of those individuals and, and start, um, I would say, be, be humanizing. Do not assume that everyone is a violent criminal. Sarah or, or Danielle, any other comments regarding that? No. Um... I, have, I do not have any budget for anything, but fortunately, compassion is free. Um, have some compassion for your fellow human being because um, um, we're in the people business here. So um, I think we, in, in many respects, we need to get the enforcement out of law enforcement when you don't need that. If you want to solve a problem rather than solve the symptom. And that's, that's what I do. Right. Another question that came in, all criminal justice processes eventually end up in the court, unless diverted, yet rarely are courts and judges included in the community decision and response to homelessness. How do we change that? And a follow-up to that question, how do we get prosecutors interested in this work? So I'll ask the questions again, and then I'd love for both of you to jump on this. All criminal justice processes eventually end up in court unless diverted, yet rarely are courts and judges included in the community discussions and response to homelessness. How do we change this? And how do we get prosecutors interested in this work? Well, here in, uh, in Hillsborough County, we have, we've got several boutique courts. So we do have pretty good, very good buy-in from the judges, prosecutors, public defenders. Um, one of our greatest allies is, um, is uh, Marie, who I, I think is listening, who, who uh, we work very closely with. Um, we talk very often. We have a boutique court for homelessness. We officially call the municipal ordinance docket, which is a municipal ordinance violation. Euphemistically, it's called the homeless court. And uh, that is another point to kind of intercept folks before they are, get too far down the line the criminal justice system. And that works very well. Basically, we get a chance to work with them and keep them out of, out of the jail, and which is not gonna happen unless they're really a prolific offender. Um, here in our circuit, judicial circuit, it takes an administrative order to, uh, to do all this. So 
Um, we've had some very forward thinking prosecutors and uh, public defenders and judges. So um, as long as we get, get the discussion going on any one of those levels, particularly prosecutors, hey, you know, you can dangle, hey, how would you like a, a smaller caseload? Maybe we can resolve this better and you're not in there prosecuting every single um, or, ordinance violation or misdemeanor there. It saves a lot of money. You know, I haven't, I've yet to meet a, uh, a court or public defender or prosecutor that has too much money or too big of a budget, or uh, I've yet to run into anyone in public service that has too much money and resources. So uh, if you can find a way to save money and make the system more efficient, uh, ultimately it comes back to solving the, pro once solving the problem, if we can do that, if the courthouse, then, then it's win-win for everyone. Yeah, I was going to add that um, oh, I talk to a lot of people. I spend a lot of my time talking to people who are working in homelessness. And so organizations like the Continuum of Care, who, are, who is the group of partners within a community where the money from HUD for ending homelessness flows down and then they, you know, disperse that in the community and the conversations among continuum of care partners is always how do we get the criminal justice system at our meetings right how do we get them involved how do we you link our data and look at the overlap between the people we're all serving um so i think that various systems all want the same thing and it's just figuring out how to do that how to come together and invite each other to your meetings and see your shared goals, see your shared populations. Um, obviously from where I sit as a researcher, data has a lot to do with it. The second you can identify the list of people who you're both trying to problem solve and serve, that goes a long way towards figuring out those, those shared solutions. And then the other thing I would say, um, the programs that we see have the best results, whether it's a supportive housing program or a rapid rehousing program, those um, service providers are in court with their clients all the time, right? So they're reminding their clients that we have court on this day, we're going to meet here, we're going to walk together to this place, or I'm going to walk you to the public defender's office, we're going to figure it all out together. Um, they show up and they say to the judge, this person is in a housing program. If they're released, they have a house to go to. I will be there with them working on this service plan. Um, that can go a long way as well. So when we look at why certain programs are successful in, in reducing arrest and reducing time in jail, often there is a huge piece um, that the service providers are doing to help navigate the criminal legal system for their clients. So thank you both being mindful of the time. Thank you so much for your time, Sarah and Danielle, and thanking the audience for joining us as well. We heard a lot of amazing nuggets and things that we need to pay attention to and try and um, implement in our own communities. Collaboration is key. We need to start talking with each other. I remember last year we brought together a few folks to, at Arnold Ventures, law enforcement practitioners, homelessness um, practitioners. And at the end of the conversation, it was a, aha, we're all on the same page. We literally just do not talk to each other enough. And so I encourage folks who are on this, who are on this um, webinar to really go back and push yourselves and to talk to each other and learn more. We are here, Bonnie will um, come back to us shortly and you will have our contact information and we look forward to hearing from you. So thank you all and looking forward to everything. Thank you so much. Um, so I guess everyone in the audience can now see how excited we were and why we were so excited to have such an incredible panel of experts. Uh, Nikki, we just wanted to stop and thank you. That is not easy to facilitate with questions coming in from all over the country. Thank you so much for responding to everyone's responses. Um, I see Daniel giving the silent clap. <laughs> so absolutely the same. Sarah, Daniel, thank you so much for all of your presentation. Again, engaging with our audience, not easy to do. Um, and so I wanted to be sure that I shared everyone's contact information to keep the discussion going. Just as Sarah, Nikki, and Daniel said, continue sharing, um, continue developing this community. And so let me share everyone's contact information. I just wanted to thank everyone for taking their time 
Um, we know everyone's very busy. We certainly know a lot of our law enforcement audience out there are dealing with a lot right now. We really thank you for taking the time uh, out of your day to do this for all of our housing folks out there. Thank you for beginning our conversation with our law enforcement individuals. And with that, we will give everyone um, a close. Thank you. And thank you for being part of our day. Take care, everyone.